Okay, well today we're going to start our study on the, the book of Revelation. Today's primarily going to be an introduction to the book. Not really going to dig into the book too much today, really not at all. The word revelation that you see in Revelation 1.1 comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. You always hear the apocalypse. You see movies, the apocalypse. It's always referring to destruction and different catastrophes that happen. Well, it's a Greek word, and it comes from Revelation 1.1. And it literally, literally means an uncovering, an unveiling, a disclosure. And the point of this book, which was given to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos when he was banished there, is to uncover things which were, before that time, not uncovered. To unveil things. And you picture a, a bride walking down the aisle with a veil on her veil is uncovered for the first time and she kisses her husband for the first time. It's an unveiling of something. And that's what Jesus seeks to do through John in this book, to unveil things that before then were not unveiled, that were not uncovered. By taking a rock up and seeing a precious jewel there. That's what God seeks to do through this book to us. This book is going to be, in my opinion, one of the most important books in the coming days, weeks, and months. If this book is teaching a futuristic view from the time it was written, okay, much further on in the future, like I think it is, then it's a training manual of sorts. It is a handbook meant to encourage, instruct, and enlighten those who will live in the last days. It is in order to prepare them for what they're going to face, for what is ahead for them. And if we are in these last days or approaching these last days, like I think we are, then this automatically becomes one of the most important books in the Bible, if not the most important book in the Bible for people who will live in those times. Not only this, but many things, according to Scripture, won't be understood until the last day. Let's go to uh, Daniel chapter 12 for a minute. <clears throat> so if we are in the last days, like, or getting close to these times that Revelation is talking about, it will be one of the most important books. But not only that, there's things that will not be understood until later times. I'm going to read to you Daniel chapter 12, <clears throat> 1 through 10, with emphasis on verse 4 and verses 8 through 10. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there will be a time of trouble, just as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. At that time, your people shall be delivered. <clears throat> everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn away turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, <clears throat> one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the, of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now obviously when he says... 
they're closed up and sealed to the time of the end. He's not talking about the book itself. I've had the book all along. Right. He's talking about the understanding of it. And the reason why understanding shall increase is because the time is coming near. And many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So that's why Daniel could not understand it wasn't the right timing for him to understand. And uh, sometimes uh, delayed understanding is necessary. So you don't focus on something that doesn't apply to you. Uh, I think you see this in the Garden of Eden. God was withholding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from Adam and Eve for good reason, I think. I don't know what that reason is, but for some reason he withheld it from them. And so delayed knowledge does not mean the absence of it. Just like delayed judgment does not mean the absence of it. So we see in the end times, knowledge shall increase. Many shall be purified, made white and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. So at the beginning of this study, you must ask yourself these two questions. Number one, will I be one of the ones that increases in knowledge that this angel is referring to, or will I stay in ignorance due to a lack of study in trying to understand this end times issue? The first question you must ask yourself. Will you say that? I can't understand it. Throw your hands up in the air and say that? I'll figure it out in the end. Or will you be one of the wise who will increase in knowledge and begin to understand these things and press in to know what these things mean? Number two, will you be one of the wicked ones that doesn't understand this end times issue? Or will you be one of the pure and wise ones that God reveals these truths to? And see, it's not a matter of either or, friends. It's a matter of both of these. You must meet both of these conditions. The preconditions to understanding the end times issue that Daniel is referring to in Daniel 12 <clears throat> is that you are pure and holy, number one, and number two, that you're seeking wisdom from God to understand it. Amen. It must be those two things. Many people who are living holy lives simply give up on understanding what these things mean, and way too soon. Other people are so caught up in end times things that is the only thing they study, yet they aren't living holy lives so they come up with all kinds of weird and unbiblical theories because only the wise shall understand. Only the pure shall understand these things. So both conditions must be met for you to understand these things. It seems like you're not understanding it. Don't give up. Keep studying. Don't give in to the pan-tribulation view that everything will pan out in the end. That is the lazy position, and it's nonsense. Christ didn't give us all this information we have in this book, which is full of stuff about the end times. He didn't give us all of this information, a whole book at the very end of the Bible. He didn't give John on Patmos this revelation so we can say, oh, I don't know what it means. He gave it to you so you could understand. He didn't give it to you, this information to confuse you or cause disorder in your mind so that you wouldn't understand it. He gave it to you so that you would be enlightened and so that you'd be prepared yourself for what is to come. And even if you and I, friends, don't go through it personally, these things that are described in Revelation, isn't it important for us to know what it means so we can teach the next generation? Yes. And so they can teach the next generation? And so eventually the generation who does go through it is prepared for it. They know what to deal with. They know what's to come. Also, Revelation is the only book of the Bible, at least that I can find, I'm not, I don't have exhaustive knowledge, that says these two things. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Now, if you can't understand what the book says, how can you keep the things that are written in it? Impossible. To keep something, to obey something, you must understand that thing. And he says, blessed is he who reads. So you must read it. I mean, some Christians, they just forget about this last book. 
well, I'm not going to understand it anyway. It's full of all this symbolic stuff. I'm just going to not read it. It says, blessed is he who reads it. Blessed is he. You need to read it. You need to understand it. You need to obey it. Keep the things that are written in it. And then at the very end of Revelation, in Revelation chapter uh, 22, 18 through 19, it says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. There's no other book in the Bible that says that. Deuteronomy alludes to stuff like that, but it doesn't say it like it does right there. Okay? This book. Now, people oftentimes, this is the last book in the Bible, so that's talking about the whole Bible. I agree, if you take away from God's word, you're in big trouble. But it's talking about this book. It says this book right there. The plagues that are in this book. You'll take out of the book of life. The good things that are in this book, you'll we'll, we'll take part in those things. There's the only book in the Bible that says these two things. That you're blessed if you read it, and you understand it, and you, and you obey it, and you're cursed if you add things to it or take away from it. That's a very important book to understand. Uh, for you to read it and to heed it. Let's talk for a second about the timing of the writing of Revelation. A very important thing to understand. There are some people in the modern day who are studying and teaching eschatology who would have us believe that Revelation was written prior to A.D. 70. And they want to teach this because they want you to think that Revelation is teaching about the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. Okay? That's what they want to teach you. And so they would say that this book, Revelation, some would say all of it's in the past. And some would say that most of it, almost all of it, is in the past. They'd also say that uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, has no future perspective. At least not for people who are living today, or who are living in the New Testament times. Personally, I think you really have to twist things pretty hard. Uh, pretty badly to come up with such conclusions as this. So I want to give you some quotes from early church uh, Christian writers who wrote about the date of this book, and they all universally believed that it was written after AD 70. All of them. There isn't one writer I could find in the early church who believed it was written before AD 70. That should tell you something. Okay. Now these writings I'm going to give you quotations from, they're not inspired writings, but some of these people were disciples of disciples of the Apostle John. Okay? And some were one step removed from that. And so these, these people all said the same thing for the most part on major issues. The first one is Irenaeus. He was a disciple of Polycarp. Um, let me spell Irenaeus for if you want to write this down. I-R-E N-A-E-U-S I-R-E N-A-E-U-S now, he was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, the writer of Revelation. Okay? He was a second century bishop in Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S, which is now France. That's where Irenaeus was a bishop. And this is what he said, speaking of the book of Revelation. For that revelation was seen not very long ago, but almost in our day, towards the end of Domitian's reign. The mission was an emperor of Rome. And he actually uh, died around AD 96, 97. Okay? So it was written at the very end, he says, of the mission's reign, not very long ago. Irenaeus wrote that about 180 AD. Okay? So less than 100 years before he wrote that, he's saying, John wrote this. Clement of Alexandria, who was a 2nd to 3rd century Christian school teacher, a Christian, you know, type of university teacher in Alexandria, Egypt. He said uh, about the Apostle John, for when on the tyrant's death, speaking of Domitian, he returned to Ephesus from the Isle of Patmos. He went away, being invited to the contiguous territories of the nations, here to appoint bishops, there to set in order whole churches, there to ordain such as were marked out by the Spirit. So basically he's saying that after John was released from Patmos on Domitian's death, he went to what's now called Turkey in our modern day. It was called Asia Minor at that point in time.
to appoint bishops, to, to instruct bishops, to teach uh, churches, and to ordain those who are marked out by the Spirit to be ordained to be bishops. Then you have Eusebius. He wrote the book called Church History. Okay. Uh, he was a 4th century bishop of the church in Caesarea, and he was the church historian. So if you ever want to read about church history in the early days, pick up a book called Church History, written by Eusebius. He was a 4th century bishop and church historian. So he said this, after talking about Domitian's rule, he said, Tradition has it that the apostle and evangelist John was still alive at this time, during Domitian's rule, and was condemned to live on the island of Patmos for his testimony to the divine word. Now, some of what he just said is actually in Revelation 1, but the part about the mission is not. And it proves that he was, as a late writing, that early writing. Then we have Victorinus. He was a late 3rd century bishop in Syria, and he was the first person that we are aware of who wrote a commentary on Revelation. In this commentary of Revelation, he said this, When John said these things, he was on the island of Patmos, condemned to the labor of the mines by Caesar Domitian. There, therefore, he saw the apocalypse, the revelation. And when grown old, he thought that he should at length receive his quittance, he should die, by suffering that island. Domitian being killed, all his judgments were discharged. So he was released because Domitian was killed. And John being dismissed from the mines, where he was suffering on Patmos, thus subsequently delivered the same revelation, the apocalypse, which he had received from God. You know, it's written to seven churches here. Seven churches is talked about here. So he delivered it to them okay, after he was released. And then we have Jerome, who was a 4th, 5th century church leader. Um, he actually wrote the Latin, or translated the Latin Vulgate. He wrote the Latin Vulgate, translated from the Greek. He says this, he actually write, wrote, a, uh, wrote a, a chapter of a book on John. He said, In the fourteenth year then after Nero, Domitian having raised a second persecution, John was banished to the island of Patmos and wrote the Apocalypse, on which Justin Martyr and Irenaeus afterwards wrote commentaries. But Domitian having been put to death and his acts on account of his excessive cruelty, having been annulled by the Senate, he returned to Ephesus under Pertanix, after continuing there until the time of the, temper, the Emperor Trajan, founded and built churches throughout all Asia, and worn out by old age, died in the 68th year after our Lord's Passion, and was buried near Ephesus. And just so you to clarify there, Mar Justin Martyr and Irenaeus didn't write verse-by-verse -verse commentaries like Victorinus. That's what it means. Victorinus was the first one to write verse-by-verse -verse commentary in Revelation. They just gave details of what they thought it was meaning in different places. So John died at a very old age, uh, 68 years after Christ died. If Christ died in 33, that means he would have died in 101. Okay. Now, if he was about the same age as Jesus, he would have been over 100 years old when he died. Okay. So he lived a long time. So in fact, there are no early Christian writers, as I said earlier, that I'm aware of that contend for an early writing of Revelation. Now, we're going to periodically come back to this issue of the date of Revelation because it's going to come up throughout this book because there's different verses people will use to try to promote an early dating of Revelation. And so, obviously, I think that the Scriptures uphold a later writing, the Lord's around 95, 96 A.D., uh, and that's why I believe it. Not just because these early church fathers say it, early church writers say it, because I believe the Scriptures uphold that position. Okay, so in this introduction, I want to give you some, some of the more prevalent, uh, prevalent uh, end-time views. And there's lots of them. So I want to go through just some of the main ones, just for a second, give you a basic overview of all of them. Okay? And as we're going through Revelation, and we go through other scriptures in the New Testament, Old Testament, I want you to kind of think, will this scripture fit in this view? Will it fit in this view? Will it fit in that? Or does it fit in this view? Okay, because I have a view... And a lot of these are just dead wrong. They're just way off, if you ask me. Okay? The first view I want to explain to you is called preterism. P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-M. Preterism. This term comes from the Latin word praetor. P-R-A-E-T-E-R. 
which is uh, in Latin means past or beyond. It simply is trying to signify that either all or the majority of Bible prophecy concerning end times was fulfilled in AD 70. That's the position that I was talking about a second ago. Now there's a full prejudice and a partial prejudice. The full prejudice says that everything is in the past. Okay? The partial prejudice would say that the only thing that's not in the past is the second coming of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. So imagine that. The full preterist says that Jesus Christ's second coming is in the past and the resurrection from the dead is in the past. Uh, this, uh, this view is not very popular among Christians. There are some who do believe it, and there seems to be a resurgence of it lately, for some reason. It was developed by a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest. That right there should tell you something. Now, of course, Jesuits were, this order of priests was created to counteract the Reformation. Now, of course, I don't agree with a lot of what happened in the Reformation, a lot of what was taught in the Reformation, but it was a counteraction to what the Reformation was doing. A very violent counteraction at times. He was a 16th, 17th century priest, and he developed this view in order to fend off the reformers who were saying stuff like the Pope is the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church is the harlot. Okay? Now, I'm not by any means agreeing with the reformers' view on these things. I think they were a people of their time and they were reacting to what they were seeing. And they were allowing themselves to interpret Scripture according to what they saw around them, which is the improper way to interpret Scripture. Okay? But it's no wonder that this Roman Catholic Jesuit priest came up with this position because he didn't want people saying that his pope was the Antichrist. He didn't want people to say that the religion he was a part of was the whore of Babylon. He didn't want people to say that. So the reason, that, the way he got that to be dismissed is to say, that well, everything in Revelation is in the past. So it couldn't possibly be talking about the Pope or us. So even though the Reformers didn't get everything right, obviously, uh, this guy, Luis del Alcazar, wasn't right either. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If a teaching is a new one, it probably isn't a true one. Because the new one, it couldn't possibly be part of what Jude 3 is talking about, which the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Jude wrote that a long time ago. Once for all delivered to the saints. He said that in the first century. So if doctrine's a new one, if it can be traced back only three, four hundred years, chances are you gotta throw it out the window. So that's preterism. Most stuff's in the past. Partial press, everything except for two things in the past. Resurrection of the dead and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then we move to the most popular view, at least in American Christianity, is the pre-trib rapture and premillennialism. So there's two things there, the rapture and the millennium. They would say the pre-trib rapture means that everyone who's a true Christian is out of here before the last seven years. You don't have to endure any of this stuff that's going to happen here. All this written revelation, all this suffering and stuff like that. You don't have to endure any of that. You're out of here. But they're also premillennial. They would say that the thousand year reign is literal. That Christ will come back. He'll reign on earth for a thousand years. So this, this view was first popularized by John Nelson Darby in 1827. And then made even more popular by the Schofield Reference Bible at the beginning of the 20th century. Of course, in more modern times, most Christians who read other books have heard of the Left Behind books. And they're really the ones who are just making it real popular, Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins. And then, of course, there were movies made that come from these books by Peter Lalonde and Tank and Cloud 10 Pictures. Many of you have seen one or more of those movies. Not biblical. Interesting. Lots of special effects. Sometimes they have, you know, popular actors in it, but not biblical. More like science fiction. It teaches that all true Christians will be taken off of this earth, so they don't have to face the tribulation. So 
So more popular teachers of this day are guys like Hal Lindsey. You might see him on TBN, the Total Blasphemy Network. John MacArthur, a major proponent of Calvinism as well. Uh, John Ankerberg, who has an Ankerberg show. Dave Hunt, who recently passed away, who has the Berean Call. David Jeremiah, who's out in California, has a major church, has radio shows and TV shows. J. Vernon McGee, who passed away a while back. He has a, a big, uh, he used to have a big radio show. Chuck Missler, Chuck Smith, who recently passed as well, and Jack Vanity. And these guys just really promote this stuff pretty heavily. And so it's one of the most popular views in American Christianity. But popularity does not equal truth. Okay? And so throughout this, we're going to, you know, we'll talk about this view too, of course, and we'll show, we'll debunk it and show how it's not true, it's not biblical. Okay? Um, and then we have post-millennialism. Okay? You see how the devil has made so many twistings of this teaching. Postmillennialism is an interpretation of chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, which sees Christ's second coming after the millennium, quote unquote. Okay, it's a, and this, uh, this time before and during the millennium is a golden age in which Christian ethics will prosper. So, millennium is not a literal thousand years, like, like I would believe it is where Jesus Christ is physically reigning on earth in Jerusalem, um, even his reign is not literally a thousand years. Instead, it teaches that Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom on earth through preaching and through discipleship, through the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Uh, Postmillennialism teaches that the vast majority of men living will eventually be saved. This, in turn, will change everything in the world. I mean, if everybody could say it, their whole world's going to be changed, right? I mean, culture will change, laws will change, politics will change, there won't be any wars anymore. This is what this view teaches. And after an extensive period of time like this where the whole world is changing, people are getting saved, and it's just completely different from what you see now in our day and age, uh, this will in turn lead to Jesus Christ returning in physical form to end history with the resurrection and the final judgment. In other words... Everything has to change first to prepare for his coming. There's no, I mean, what does he have to punish when he comes? Because most people are Christians. Doesn't teach a great falling away at the end. It teaches a great revival, a great salvation at the end. If the Bible says that the Spirit expresses this in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And this is one of those views, I believe, that leads to those kind of things. Because why would you, why would you be watching and waiting for Jesus to return if everything has to change first? And this is why you see a lot of people hold this view. They're they're out in culture. They're trying to make Christian movies, and they're trying to change the movie scene. They're getting involved in politics. They want to change the political scene. They want to change things through laws, and through legality, not through the preaching of the gospel, but through legal systems. They want to change things. It was pop it's a fairly new idea, once again, just like the, the last two views were. It's a fairly new idea in the scope of Christianity. It was popularized in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, by proponents of the, of the social gospel. Abolitionists, politicians, people trying to bring changes through the political process. That's what is made popular by. Well, if you're trying to advance an agenda that we should have a Christian nation and Christian laws and all these things, of course, this is this fits perfectly with that. It goes right along with it. <clears throat> Popular modern teachers of the tradition are R.J. Rushdoony, not a funny name, but he's a popular teacher. Gary North, <laughs> Kenneth Gentry, Lorraine Botner, who's a, and all these guys I think are Calvinists, by the way, just so you know. Lorraine Botner, and one name you're going to recognize, Greg Bonson. <coughs> he taught this to you. Yeah. So that's post-millennialism in a nutshell. Now let's move on to ah-millennialism. That is ah, but negating. Ah-millennialism. A negates. 
Millennialism means a thousand. So literally what this view teaches is that the thousand year reign is just spiritual, it's just figurative. There's no literal thousand year reign. According to them, we're living in it right now. Okay? So it's the belief, it's a rejection of the belief that Jesus will have a literal thousand year long physical reign on earth. Rejects that. Uh, this view seems to be, from what I can ascertain, popular among moral government people. They believe this view. So the thousand year reign talked about in Revelation 20 is just symbolic, not literal. It's already begun, and it's identical to the current church age, which began with the destruction of the temple in, in Jerusalem, AD 70. Amillennialism teaches that Christ's reign during the, the millennium is spiritual in nature. It does, however, teach that Christ will eventually return in final judgment and establish a permanent reign in the new heaven and the new earth. Sorry, Bert, can you briefly go over that again? Yeah, sure. This whole thing? Yeah, you're talking about amillennialism still. That's right. Yeah, just the last part of it. So okay. Sorry. Yeah, so it holds that um, the millennium began with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, AD 70, which began the church age, which is that terminology is found nowhere in Scripture, of course. Um, so the millennium is strictly spiritual in nature. It's not literally a thousand years, but it does teach, once again, that Christ will return in final judgment instead of a permanent rule here on earth. The new heaven, new earth. Now, I really couldn't find any, couldn't pinpoint any major teachers in this day and age who teach this, but there were some people from the past who you, you would recognize. Origen, he was a third century teacher in Alexandria, Egypt, who is famous for spiritualizing and allegorizing almost everything in Scripture as he interprets it. He was very, very rare was he a literal interpretation of Scripture. So Origen believed it, but he believed a lot of bad things, unfortunately. Uh, Augustine believed it. Now, at one point in time, Augustine believed in literal millennialism. But at some point in time, he gave up on that. Just like he gave up on free will and went to what we today call Calvinism. He was like the father of it. Uh, many of the uh, Protestant reformers believed in it during the 16th century and 17th century, including John Calvin, including the writers of the Augsburg Confession, which is for the Lutheran Church, and other confessions during that time as well, believed in amillennialism. Once again, I think they were a people of their time. They were allowing their time to determine what they would believe instead of the other way around. In modern times, it's prominent in many different denominations. It's prominent in the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, what is called the Reformed Church, the Methodist Church, the Anglican Church, the Amish Church, the Mennonite Church, Churches of Christ, Church, uh, Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. It's pretty prominent. But it's an allegorical, a spiritualizing of scriptures. And who's driving the bus of interpretation? Mr. Literal. So they say, get in the back seat of the bus, man. Uh, Mr. Figurative is going to drive the bus now which is not the way Scripture works. So there's lots of people who believe in this. Um, and we'll see, once we get to Revelation 20, a long time from now, maybe a couple of years from now, who knows. Uh, when we get there, we'll see that they have no reason to take it figuratively or allegorize it or spiritualize it. It's just ridiculous. They just, it's really, they have to come to Scripture with an idea in mind to say, oh, I think that's not really a thousand years. That's what they have to do. Uh, then there's the pre-wrath rapture. Okay. Second to last view now. Pre-wrath rapture. Very similar to mid-trib. Very small difference between the two things, so I'm not really going to get into mid-trib. But this view teaches that saints will be raptured about the halfway mark of the seven-year mark, the last seven years. Sometime after the three and a half year mark. That's what they teach. Uh, they won't say exactly when it will happen, but that it will happen after the sixth seal is open in Revelation chapter 6. 
difference in a mid-trib and this is a mid-trib would say it happens exactly the three and a half year mark. Uh, those who are left on earth will face the wrath of God via the trumpets and the bowls. Um, and this is when they believe that the wrath of God, according to their terminology, wrath of God, will be poured out on earth, which is why they're termed preening wrath. This view seeks to emphasize that though the Christian will face tribulation, uh, they won't ever have to endure the wrath of God, so they must be taken from the earth before God's wrath is poured out on it. Uh, so this view proposes a more chronological interpretation of Revelation that it's completely in order. From chapter 1 to chapter 22, it's all in order. That's what they would say. Okay. Uh, and this, this is a modern view once again. Jude 3. Modern view once again. Uh, not a very popular view in our day, although there are some who believe I think. I think that maybe that guy, Stephen Anderson, uh, who put out that documentary, so I think he might actually hold to this. Okay, now, he might call himself post-trib, but that's because of the terminology he's using. Pre-wrath would say they're post-trib, too. But they're defining the wrath of God as the trumpets and the bowls, and therefore they say, well, that's pre-wrath, but it's post-trib, because trib is the first three and a half years, and wrath the last three and a half years. Okay, so it's just terminology there. Um, and then we have the view that, uh, oh, oh, sorry, there's, there's really no people who I'm aware of in this day and age who are popular teachers who would teach us there are some names, but if I told you them, you wouldn't recognize them. You wouldn't know who they are. I didn't, I didn't know who they were. So I'm assuming you probably wouldn't know who they were, so I didn't even put them down. And then we have the view, which I would consider the, the biblical view. It's called post-trib premillennialism. Okay. Uh, post-trib referring to the rapture, the catching up of the saints, happens after the tribulation, after the whole seven years. Okay. And premillennial, of course, stands for when Jesus returns. He's coming back before the thousand-year reign. Literal thousand-year reign. This view is what I would consider the historical view of the church. All of the early church fathers believe this view from what I can tell, except for Origen, who I mentioned before. Therefore, it is not a new view and fits perfectly with Jude, chapter, uh, Jude verse 3. It teaches that the rapture and the first resurrection are synonymous. So they're the same exact thing. They're not different events. They don't happen at different times. The rapture and the first resurrection are the same thing. It teaches that believers will go through the whole tribulation, all seven years. And during those seven years, some will turn away from the faith. Some will be protected from the Antichrist during the last three and a half years. And some will be persecuted by the Antichrist and put to death. It teaches that although God will pour out his wrath on the earth during some of this time, that the believers will not suffer any of it. Kind of like Noah and his family. They were on earth when God's wrath was poured out, but they didn't suffer from it. Kind of like Lot and his two daughters. They were in the vicinity of where all that wrath was poured out, but they suffered none of it. That's what this view teaches. It teaches that Christ will return at the very end of the last seven years, to set up his literal, physical, 1,000-year reign on earth. It teaches that Satan will be bound for 1,000 years during Christ's reign on earth, and then released for a short period of time to deceive the nations again. And then Satan will finally be crushed, and Judgment Day will ensue after the second resurrection of the dead, because there's two resurrections. And this is the position I hold to from my studies on this issue it's the position I think Revelation teaches, obviously, and the rest of Scripture teaches. And it's the position I will seek to convince you of over the next two or three years, however long or short it takes. I know Matthew took uh, about three or three years or so. Of course, it wasn't every single week, but Revelation probably took a little longer. Okay, so these are all the views, the most, I mean, there may be some other views too, but these are the major views that are out there. And as, as we go through Revelation, I want you to kind of picture, well, does that fill, fit in amillennialism? Does that fit in postmillennialism? Does that fit in preterism? You know, kind of, because they're, they're, they think that it's supported by the Bible, too. They think their position is. And so we'll, we're, I'm not going to, instead of doing a, you know, a topical teaching on each one of those, 
I just want to go through Revelation verse by verse, and we're going to say, does, does, do, are these views supported by Revelation? Okay, let's talk about hermeneutics. And we did a, a study on this before, but let's talk about when it comes to apocalyptic literature. Okay, very important. There is lots of symbolic language in apocalyptic literature. Okay? Not all of it will be literal, but we must be careful not to read crazy things into it like Black Hawk helicopters and nuclear wars and stuff like that. Okay? That simply just aren't there. They're just not there. And that's part of these people I saw before who they spend all their time studying end time stuff, but they're not living holy, so they're not going to understand these things. They just kind of read crazy things into it. We also need to be careful not to let things we see in the news interpret what we read in this book. Some people are just so caught up in watching Fox News and MSNBC and CNN. And anytime they see a catastrophe on TV, oh, that's in the Bible. And so we've got to be careful we're not allowing present, just like the Reformers did. They had the same problem. They didn't have CNN and MSNBC MS and, and Fox News, but they still read into stuff. And so we'd be careful we're not doing that. People think that they see lots of fish dead. Well, must be a biblical prophecy being fulfilled. Well, they see lots of birds drop out of the sky. Isn't that in the book of Enoch? <laughs> Someone throws a bunch of red dye into a body of water. Well, I mean, Jesus Christ is coming back tomorrow then. What they'll say. They see these things. Uh, a swarm of locusts destroying a crop somewhere. Well, that's in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 20. What they'll say. Which doesn't exist. There's no chapter 6, verse 20. Um, they'll see the Pope do some horribly wicked thing. Well, he's the Antichrist, they'll declare. You know, putting their stake down too, too soon. Well, Obama's rejecting the Constitution and appealing to the laws of the European Union. He must be the one world leader. That's the thing people do. Now, obviously, if, if we do end up living in end times when these things are happening, we're going to see some things happening that are contained in Revelation. We must be very careful not to try to fit a square block into a circle hole. Okay? It doesn't work. So we must be careful. And we will take as much of it literally as we possibly can. Because Mr. Literal is driving the bus of interpretation. Okay? Just like any other book, we will seek to define the terms, the words, the phrases, the different things said in this book from the book itself or from the rest of the Bible. That's what we're going to do. Okay? Not read our modern times into it. When Old Testament passages are alluded to, because there's no, there's no Old Testament passages quoted, literally in Revelation, but there's lots of allusion to the same things in the Old Testament. When those things happen, we'll go to them and see what they say. There's going to be times when the Old Testament passages will actually be just the same thing. It's talk about the same event, just in a different time period. Sometimes, so we're talking about a similar event. And there'll be a good comparison. Because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he's done something in the past a certain way, he'll probably do it the same way in the future. Okay? There may be some things that we simply will not have answers to. And friends, we have to be content with that. And we have to be careful not to try to find out details on things that we're simply not going to have and read things in that aren't there. Just like I've said many times, where the Bible stops, we must stop. Remember what Daniel 12 says, knowledge will increase. People run to and fro. Knowledge will increase. If you're staying holy, you keep on seeking, we may get more answers in time, but it may take time. And so I don't want you to think that this this study is going to be the end-all, be-all. I mean, this is, there may be some other things we're going to learn along the way. All of us. Revelation, from my reading of it, I've read it probably, I don't, I don't like putting numbers on things, but probably between 50 to 100 times over the last three years. Okay, I've read Revelation. It's been reading, reading, reading. It's, oh, I always like to immerse myself in the book, read it over and over and over again, just to get it in my head. And I even study it, just reading it. Okay. And in my study of it, I have come to the conclusion that it is not chronological. Okay? And sometimes chapter 7 does not necessarily follow chapter 6. There's going to be repeating of things. 
the same time frame, just different things happening during those time frames, a repeating of things. I, I tried to find a comparison to this, and the only thing I think of, back when I was a sinner, I liked a lot of wicked movies, and there was a movie called Pulp Fiction. In this movie, you saw the different <laughs> scenarios happen, and they weren't all happening at the same time. They weren't happening after. Sometimes you went back in history to see it happen again. This is the same way Revelation is. I'm not recommending you watch that movie, so don't go watch it. But I'm, if those of you who have watched it, you know what I'm talking about. It's going back to these different scenarios over and over again, retelling the same story in different ways. Yet I'm not just a making. I'm not just making this assertion that it's not chronological. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to tell you why I think certain events couldn't possibly that are later on in Revelation couldn't possibly be after ones that are written beforehand. I'm going to show you in the language why I think that couldn't possibly be. And different things that are happening. Uh, even though this is true, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to seek to teach this book, even though it's not chronological, I'm still going to seek to teach this book verse by verse. Okay? Without jumping ahead, unless I have to. Okay? Uh, this will take some help from you. Because there's going to be times where we'll read in a certain book, part of Revelation, and you say, well, what about this up here? And I'm going to ask you to hold yourself back, okay? Because we'll get to it eventually. And I really want to stick it verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And eventually we'll get to that part and we can look back and say, well, this is the way it meshes with this part over here, okay? I know, I know this kind of stuff is exciting to, to learn about and to understand. And, um, you know, in time, I think most of your questions will be answered. Notice I didn't say all of them, because I can't say that. But I think most of your questions will be answered in time. Uh, and we may jump around a little bit, but I definitely will seek to minimize that as much as possible. So if we're in Revelation chapter 6 and you have a question about Revelation chapter 16, I'm going to ask you to hold your question until we get there. And then when it comes to the Old Testament, there are lots of end time scriptures in the Old Testament that we will look at. Um... And we'll do some comparison. Sometimes we'll give more details. Sometimes we'll give definitions for things. But we'll look at some Old Testament passages. Sometimes, like I said, there's things in the Old Testament that are similar. It's not the same event that's happening in the future. But it happened in the past. And so you can see similarities. It's like a parallel running along the other. Okay, and we'll see that too. All right? But we have to be careful when we go to the Old Testament. Not to, because it looks similar that it's automatically talking about something in the future. It could be talking about, well, obviously, it was future for that person, but I'm talking about now, for our future. It could have been talking about something happening to Israel, and Israel alone, and not about us. But it's always good to compare those things, because they're parallel. <coughs> and so, you know, and also, once again, we'll find definitions for different terms and different languages from the Revelation uh, that we'll find in the Old Testament. Okay, so this is the this is a basic introduction to Revelation. Um, I hope you understand how important it is to understand this book, uh, and that uh, I would encourage you, starting now, if you haven't already, to start reading through this book as we're going through this, uh, because you'll sometimes you'll you'll just start understanding stuff without anyone teaching it to you, because the Holy Spirit's teaching you these things. Uh, so. If you've had a pan trip view in the past, you need to repent of that. Because God didn't give you this book for you to say, oh, it'll all pan out in the end. God didn't give you a whole book of doctrine and say, oh, all the doctrines will pan out in the end. Imagine if we treated every doctrine that way. What would we preach? Nothing. What would we share with people? How would we disciple people? And if, if, a, if a large majority of this book is talking about prophecies, then surely God didn't put it in there for us to misunderstand it. And hopefully you understand the importance of the writing of, of Revelation, that whole views are based upon it being written uh, earlier on than it really was. And as we go through this, I want you to I want you to see if these, you know, I want you to picture those boxes that have a different shape, a star shape, a triangle, a square, a circle. And I want you to picture those being different views at the end times. And I want you to take the Bible and see if it fits in those spots. See if it works. Because if it doesn't work, you need to reject it. To, to, I mean, I don't know what everyone's views here are. I mean, I know most of you probably believe what I believe on this, but 
uh, you have a similar view to me, but uh, we need to make sure that what we're believing about these issues fits all of Scripture. And let's, let's make sure we apply uh, proper hermeneutics during this time. Okay, that's, uh, that's all I have for today, so we'll open up the floor for questions or things you want to add or objections. Okay, Brother Josh. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you had any um, like books or resources that you'd recommend that we could um, further study the different views. Oh, study different views. Yeah, so that way we can okay. better compare them to um, there's scripture. A, yeah, there's a book written by um, Steve Gregg, which is uh, it's called The Four Views of Revelation, something similar to that. I have it at home. And I, I really can't endorse it. I, mean, I don't know. I, I think you're just trying to get an objective view of four different views. So just like anything else, you need to be discerning about what you're reading and being worrying about it. But um, when it comes to different people from different ones, well, there's different teachers I gave you from different sections. You can check those out. I don't know if I, I gave you any for preterism or not. Did I give you any for preterism? Let me see. No, I didn't. One, one guy for preterism would be R.C. Sproul. He's a big guy in that. So, but the other ones I gave you, if I knew someone who would, who you can learn about their view from, you can you can read those those ones I gave you, those names I gave you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd probably encourage everybody to to wait. That's what I would do. I would encourage everybody to wait and learn about this as we go through it. Yeah. That's what I would encourage everybody to do. Um, not commanding everybody to do that, but uh, to wait, as because I know as you go through this, all of these things are going to be covered. And uh, because there's some of these these teachers that are false teachers, yeah. And uh, we would never want to encourage you to study no. from false teachers That's right. uh, because, um, well, you could. You could get snared up, deceived. and that stuff get deceived, right. and uh, you could be one of those that goes that becomes wicked, doesn't understand these things, and uh, so I would I would actually encourage everybody to just wait, and um, let the Lord teach us as we go through this. I, I was thinking about uh, the uh, preterism and how that's rising, right. and I've noticed that you know uh, these guys, you know Gary Demar and Brian right. Countergraph, these yeah. guys. And uh, uh, seems like the enemy, as we the day is drawing near, is not going to back off. But just even as, as it says, even later in the Book of Revelation, he knows his time is short. Right. As we look at that, what does he do? He has great wrath, so he he pushes harder. He's going to bring more confusion, more false doctrines. Uh, preterism would be rising. These false doctrines would be rising as the day is drawing near. Right. So I was I was thinking about that. Why is preterism rising? Well. The enemy doesn't want people to watch. So if these things have already taken place, you know, we don't need to watch. That's right. Jesus told us to watch, but if it already happened, then we don't need to watch. So Satan definitely wants to put people to sleep. So I was thinking that that's probably a good reason why preterism is rising right now. True. It's probably not going to go away. Yeah. It's probably going to become more popular. Yeah. popular. And uh, so those are some thoughts that I had there. Yeah, I just want to, you know, kind of draw our attention back to the first thing that you told us, which I perfectly agree with in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 12, is that you have to have uh, both qualifications met. Uh, you have to both be pure and holy and be seeking after the wisdom of God. And uh, any view, whoever they're taught by, if they don't meet both of those qualifications, I mean, they might seem wise, but if they're not actually living pure and holy, then we can't rely upon them for an accurate depiction of these end times views. Uh, so if I look at R.C. Sproul and I say, well, he teaches that you sin all the time and you can't stop at sinning. Now, how can I trust someone like that to meet both of those qualifications? I can't. So I say that if you look at teachers, uh, we judge them by their fruits, just like we judge any teacher by their fruit. 
And if they're, if they're seen to be a false teacher, if they're teaching false theologies that says we can sin all the time, if they're actually a wolf in sheep's clothing, that any conclusions they come up with on the end times is going to be wrong. It's just going to be wrong because they're not living holy. So that's really good. And another thing I want to say is kind of like an admonition or a warning is there are cults out there that will use end times uh, to draw you into their cult. Uh, one of those is uh, Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, that's how they evangelize. They will hold a eschatology conference, and they will go over esch eschatology. It will seem very detailed, very wise, and they get people all caught up in these, these details. And it really, uh, you know, people kind of get fascinated because it's like you said, it's almost like science fiction. So they see these things like, wow, this is exciting, this is fascinating. I mean, I used to know uh, people who, uh, whenever I was a sinner, they were sinners, and uh, they had no love for God at all, but they were fascinated uh, with these end times prophecies. They would read the Left Behind books, and they'd read those books over and over and over again, but to get them to pick up the Bible, you'd have to, I don't know, you'd have to force them to do that. Uh, so uh, these things can seem interesting to sinners, uh, so we have to be careful about that. And uh, another thing I'd just ask is, I know a lot of people do this, and it almost seems to be like a stigmatism or whatever of showing my charts and stuff, but this is very complex. Are you planning on, sh as we go through it, like maybe showing charts so we can keep it straight in our minds? Talking about chronology? Yeah, just, you know, because like you said, we're going to go verse by verse by verse and not get ahead. Uh, are you planning on maybe, as we go, like maybe building on a chart so we can maybe keep things straight, or have you considered that? I've considered giving handouts. I'm not real big with the uh, PowerPoint type stuff. I mean, I could do that, but I think handouts are better. That way you have it with you. You're not just taking notes. You actually have it with you. So, yeah, I thought about, uh, as I'm thinking about the chronology of everything myself, whereas the, um, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls especially, uh, putting those together. And uh, while we're doing this, I'm keeping all my notes on file. I'm almost maybe like a commentary kind of. On each chapter as I go along and adding stuff to it as I go along. So um, when I'm done with that, I'll make it available. People can reference back to it and they'll have basically all the notes I have there. Um, and so yes, I, th I think uh, I think charts will be important so you can see timelines and that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I think it's going to be, even though I will have those things, it's going to be ba pretty basic to, to get it and get it down. And some of it's not going to be real, real precise, I mean, because, like I said, we don't have all the details. And um, it'll become more precise over time. You know, so if something's had, if you have, say you have, uh, you know, seven trumpets over seven years, doesn't mean what's happened January 1st one year, what's happened January 1st or the next year. It's, so it's, it can happen anywhere within there, but I'll give a general time frame on when it's going to happen. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because we're doing it verse by verse all the way through, yeah. and uh, kind of kind of going back to what Tracy was saying, uh, is what spurred this this thought or idea question in my mind. Do you think the teachings would be compartmented so if you, like, if you were to take the videos, you could rearrange them so it would uh, be chronological uh, in thinking, uh, like you just cover this part that would. Um, you see what I'm saying? I, I think what, what what I'll do is that when I get past certain parts that are repeats, right, I'll go back and review the parts that mm -hmm. aren't repeating okay. with. Okay. Yeah. So, for example, if I were to go to the the trumpets and there, if I were to say, well, they're about the same time as the seals, I would go back and try to give you a chronology together with that. Instead of going forward and leaving ahead, I'll go backwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which you're expecting our questions to all be yeah. backwards, not yes. forwards. That's right. I want your questions to go backwards, not forwards. That we're not jumping ahead of things, and of course, on top of I mean, on top of Revelation, in Old Testament, we're going to go to like Matthew twenty-four, Luke twenty-one, Mark thirteen, Second Thessalonians two, First Thessalonians five, Second Peter three, uh, First Corinthians fifteen. We're going to go to all these different passages uh, to talk about all these things because other scriptures in the New Testament talk about these things as well. And so, at some point in time, they're going to come into play. Now, when they do, will be determined as we go along. But they're all going to come to play at some point in time.
just a word of encouragement going along with something you already said regarding the pan view, where it all pan out. Uh, the scripture of 2 Timothy 3.16, where it's saying that all scriptures by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man that God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, equipped for every good work. So, uh, just an encouragement to keep that in mind if if the a thought of pan comes up. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had another question. Uh, who are some people who believe the post-trib premillennial premillennialism? Uh, the only person who I, I can recommend in any fashion at this point in time is maybe Joe Schimmel. Uh, but uh, I, I haven't listened to his stuff, so I just know Brother Kevin has talked about it quite a bit, and he, he recommends it, so I can recommend it based on his recommendation. But uh, there, there may be differences. I mean, I'm not going to be listening to his stuff as I go along. I'm just, I'm just trying to seek to allow the Lord to speak to me. And so I'm not really <coughs> supplementing my study with other. I've, I've listened to people like Tim Warner in the past, but I would never recommend him now. He believes hell's not eternal. So I couldn't recommend him. But I, some of his, I mean, a lot of his stuff I agree with too, but I wouldn't recommend listening to his stuff or watching his stuff because it, it promotes his stuff naturally by watching listening to it. And um, I, I, as I remember, I haven't listened to his stuff for a long time. We listened to it probably, what, four or five years ago now, something like that? And I haven't listened to his stuff on this in a long time. But I remember some of the stuff as I went through, I had lots of questions still. Uh, details I thought he could have gave that he didn't give. And so I'm hoping to give more details, as uh, many details as I possibly can. So I'm not really listening to anyone myself. I, I, I've never read a book that promotes this view. Okay, so uh, I'm just trying to show you, I'm, I'm trying to come my, my best with a clean slate here I thought the Lord teach me and then to bring it to you. So um, that might mean that there may be some people who go in more detail than me. Uh, or maybe that I go in more, there might be different perspectives and different things. So um, I know um, there are people like Joe Shimo who study these things out quite a bit. And he has lots of teachings on it. I think, it, I think they're actually going through Revelation right now or something like that. I don't, they're yeah. still in it. It's very extensive. Yeah, I think I think John was mentioning it to me. Yeah, I was, I was downloading all the audios. And yeah. He has like two or three teachings on one church. Oh, okay. You know, and, and that's how that's how yeah. thoroughly they're going through it. And I haven't even, I've only listened to, I think I've only listened to two of them so far. Right. Okay, yeah, he's very gone, extensive. He's gone through Revelation many times. Yeah. Yeah, so it's. But the current, the stuff. one I'm talking about now is the current one that right. going through right now. So okay. it's been since April of 2012, I believe. So. But if you listen to his stuff and then you hear me teach on the same chapter, and you ask me a question from what he's teaching, I'm not going to know what you're talking about. So um, all I can say is either I might have an answer to it, or I might not, or I might have to study it more, or whatever you're talking about. But uh, I'm just seeking what the Lord really thinks to me. And a suggestion for the for the saints, uh, with your approval, of course, brother, is wherever we see in the New Testament where the disciples are asking Jesus, what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age, that's a, a very particular, interesting part of Scripture. And you rattle off a bunch of them there in, in a row, but uh, to, to bring our focus uh, on those things in regards to Revelation. Yeah, I mean, if you want to supplement, if you have a read through Revelation and you want to supplement with other New Testament scriptures, you have Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, all synoptic gospels talking about the same situation. And then you have, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, and a little bit of 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 2 Peter 3, uh, a little bit of Jude. You, these, are, these are the scriptures you have to go to. And so if you have a cross reference Bible, or a reference Bible that gives you reference down the middle or at the bottom, a lot of times you'll come to the verse in Revelation and it'll say, well, go back, it'll tell you where it's something like that's mentioned. So you can go back to that and you can get a more full uh, understanding of these things. So, yeah.
Yeah, this one, uh, some of this uh, occurred to me, I started thinking about it. Um, now you said that if it's a new teaching or new doctrine, then chances are it's a wrong doctrine uh, because the Bible says that uh, it was once and for all delivered to the saints. Right. The faith is once and all for all delivered to the saints. Now, uh, if you were to look uh, at what the early church believed on this, uh, you would see that they did believe uh, basically uh, uh, post-trib, which they didn't call it back then, they just call it premillennial because there was no other premillennial position out there. Uh, so they just called it premillennial at that time. So, But the thing that I wanted to point out is also in uh, Daniel 12, 4, it does say that knowledge shall be increased. So even though the basic idea is the same, yeah. uh, the details yeah. over the span of time right. can be uh, increased. Right. We can have a deeper understanding than what they had. Right. Uh, even though it's the same basic view, we can have more details and a deeper understanding only because knowledge over time shall be increased according to Daniel uh, twelve four. So I just want to put that clarification out. Yeah, it's a good distinction to make because we're not talking about new ideas. We're talking about more details than the same ideas. We're not talking about stuff that's contradicting what's been taught in the past or taught or believed in the past. Talking about something that's edifying and, and improving upon what was taught in the past. So obviously, what I'm referring to in two three is stuff that contradicts and was in no form or shape believed in the past. That's a good distinction to make, yeah, because it's got to be clarified with that, yeah. And by past, you mean the historical primitive church, the Nicene church. That's right. That's right. The Antonicene church, the church before the Nicene council, the first three centuries, I'm talking about. After that, it started to go a little downhill. But, uh, but June 3, that was written in the first century, and then two centuries after that, it was pretty pure, man, doctrinally speaking. Uh, things were fought off, and people were on target for the most part.